This morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 20, picking up where we left off last week. Acts chapter 20, we begin in verse 25. Remember what's going on here is Paul has called the elders to come and meet with him. And uh, as he's making his way towards Jerusalem to carry a gift to uh, help out the saints there who are um, dealing with uh, famine. And on his way, he, he doesn't stop in Ephesus, but he stops along the way about 30 miles from Ephesus, and he calls all of the elders to come and meet with him. And so what we have in Acts chapter 20 is Paul's elder meeting. He, uh, in some ways, uh, vindicates himself as he declares who he is, what he's done. He uh, calls to their attention his ministry, what they've seen of him. He also um, gives them some exhortation and some charge. He gives them some definition as to what they should be doing as elders of the church. And so uh, this morning as we look at this passage, um, it is good for us to uh, be able to see this uh, inside, um, inside look at this meeting. In, in the book of Acts, Luke only records one message that is given directly to believers and especially here in this passage, this is the only passage in this uh, in the entire book of Acts where the message is directed at believers, especially those um, Ephesian elders. And so it's important for us as we uh, seek to um, imitate and learn from this interaction that Paul has with the leaders of the church. And so this morning, as we talk about some of the responsibilities and the um, uh, just the, the job of an elder... Uh, don't be um, don't be too quick to like say, well, I'm not an elder, so what does this matter, right? Um, this is not a message just for Nathan, right? <laughs> this is for all of us. And so, as we go through this, this is uh, in some ways it gives you an opportunity to um, to check and evaluate, and know um, the job of an elder. It is also an opportunity for you to encourage your elders in uh, accomplishing these tasks. It is uh, an opportunity for you to um, think through um, what what God wants for an elder. Is also um, uh, it also uh, encourages and defines what the congregation is uh, is to be in response to that elder's uh, leading of the church. And so, as we go through this passage, uh, it's not just for the elder. In Acts chapter twenty, uh, we'll begin in verse twenty five. And uh, I'll read through verse 31. That is our text this morning. And then after we read, um, we'll pray together. It says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 25. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert Remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. And his message continues, but this will be the text that we focus on this morning and then next week we'll, we'll continue. We need the Lord's help in understanding and applying these truths. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word, for the opportunity to to study it, to um, examine it, and to allow it to examine us. I pray that this morning you would give us um, humility and uh, a desire to learn and grow. I pray that as I communicate to your people that you would give me wisdom and just clarity in the things that I say. I pray that you would uh, make this time fruitful for us as we seek to be more like you, as we, we know that um, we need to be challenged, and uh, I pray that 
you would do the work that only you can do this morning in, uh, in the way that your word is uh, applied to the hearts of people. I pray, I pray that your spirit would be working to give us um, uh, illumination into this text. I pray that we might be convicted if that is uh, what is needed and encouraged if that is what is needed. I pray that you would um, guide our time and uh, help us not to get distracted by things that maybe happened this past week or things that are coming up in the, this upcoming week. But I pray that um, you would give us uh, just uh, some, some clear thoughts in the way that we study your word. I pray that the way that we study this text would bring you um, glory. I pray that through the teaching of your word and through the application of your word that uh, your worth would be acknowledged. I pray that worship would take place as we study this morning. We thank you so much for, again, for blessing us with this opportunity to worship you in this way. I pray that you would guide our hearts so that we might receive these truths and make application of them. I pray that you would um, help me not to say anything that would distract from the, your truth so that you might be glorified. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 25, we see that this is, this is a serious deal, right? This is... Um, Paul meeting with the leaders of the church in Ephesus. And as he meets with them, he knows that they will not see each other again. Let me ask you this question. What would you say to a group of people that you served if you knew you'd only have one last chance to talk with them face to face? What would be the thing that you would want to communicate? And it probably depends on who those people are and the situation, the setting. In this setting... Um, Paul has served alongside these, these men, and they know of his ministry. They have shed tears together. They have worked hard together. They have spread the gospel together. Paul ministered alongside these elders. He was um, known by them as a co-laborer. And uh, so this morning, the first thing that we see is Paul, he, he vindicates his ministry. As there could have been... Um, uh, in the, in the context or understanding why he's saying what he's saying, there could have been some who had already come in as wolves trying to sway people, and they were kind of um, spreading some gossip about Paul or spreading some, uh, trying to discredit his ministry in some way. And so in meeting with these elders, he, number one, sets an example for them, but number two, he defends his own ministry before these elders so that the church um, doesn't question you know, his leadership and what, uh, what impact he's had in this church. And so... He ministers alongside these elders. We'll see that first. We also see that he um, testified of his innocence, and he declared the whole purposes of God as he, um, he vindicates himself by, uh, by his life. So, first of all, his ministry of preaching is seen as he uh, ministered alongside these elders. He's preaching. He says, And now, behold, I know that all of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. He was preaching the kingdom. What does this mean? The message of the gospel is here referred to as preaching the kingdom. What is meant by preaching the kingdom? I think um, there are other texts, other passages that help us understand this. Uh, looking at one uh, quickly, Luke 17 and verse 21, it says, nor will they, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. This is Jesus speaking to Pharisees. As he says, there's going to be some that are going to say, you go this way to find it, and you go that way to find it. And he says, look, it's in your midst. How is it in their midst? Well, the king was there, and he now rules and reigns in the hearts of people. And so their proclamation was an invitation to the kingdom by giving an allegiance to the king of kings. And so it's interesting that he refers to the gospel in so many different ways in Acts chapter 20. And here he refers to it as preaching the kingdom. The kingdom of God. As we have a king in Jesus. 
who does rule and reign over us, who has every bit of authority over us. This past week, I had the, uh, the privilege of meeting with two gentlemen, and uh, we were looking at a passage uh, in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Where it says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And so in Ephesians, there's this contrast that is made between those who know Jesus and those who don't know Jesus. And he's and in Ephesians, uh, writing again to this church, there are those who were believers, and um, he talks about who they were before they became believers. Who were they before they became believers? Well, they were gross. They were dead in their trespasses and sins. They were um, without life. They walked according to the world, according to the prince, the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And so what Paul is communicating with his elders is that people should come out of that kingdom and into this kingdom of Jesus. One man strives to serve in the kingdom. Others strive to be the king. We recognize that we are blessed to be a part of this kingdom as followers of Jesus. This, um, this proclamation is that sinners in the realm of Satan and death and destruction and the kingdom of darkness, they can enter the realm of salvation and life and glory. This is the message that he preaches, that he teaches with these other elders. He says, look, you know, you know how we serve together. What other message has the ability to tie people's hearts together, to knit them together in such a way to see God glorified? So we see the way that Paul interacted and worked with these, these elders. Some simple application that we pull from this is that when you do ministry together, whenever you sweat together, you work together, you are um, uh, engaging the world with the truth of the gospel, advancing the kingdom of God, there is uh, something that happens where these you just you end up being drawn close together. It happens as you, as you work together, as you suffer together as you strive together. And so what happens here is he says, look, you brothers, you know me. I know you. There's this closeness between us. You know my, my ministry. You know what we communicated, the importance of that, that communication. And then what he says is, and I'm no longer going to see you. No longer to see his face. Now this is where things get real. I say, okay, so I'm never going to see Paul again. Why? Well, it's because Paul knows that he's headed into difficulty. He knows that there's, there's no way he's going to make it back to Ephesus. As one commentator said, watching Paul's ministry is like tracking a wounded hare through the snow. There's a trail of blood that yields where he's been. That's the way it was with Paul. This becomes an important moment for these elders as they are now given this essential message from Paul. What does he want to communicate in this last opportunity to encourage and exhort these leaders of the church. Well, he begins by testifying of his innocence. He says, I uh, am innocent of the blood of all men. Verse 26, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. What does Paul mean by this statement? Well, he has a clear conscience. He says, look, I have done everything in my ability to communicate the truth to everybody that I come in contact with. There is a definite understanding of responsibility in this statement, right? And it could be, as Paul voices this, uh, it could be that he's referring to a passage in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, it may be that this, this passage has come to his mind, to his attention, to his memory as he's sharing this, as the Holy Spirit may have brought this to his attention. In verse 18 of chapter 3 in Ezekiel, it says, When I say to the wicked, this is when um, God gives Ezekiel kind of his commission. He tells him, this is your job. This is what you're going to do for me as my prophet. Okay? 
He says, when I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way, that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you have warned the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. Again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle before him, he will die. Since you have not warned him, he shall die in his sin. And his righteous deeds, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood I require at your hand. However, if you have warned the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, you shall surely live because he took warning, and you have delivered yourself. So this is the, the responsibility and the commitment that Paul has made that he's going to make sure that there is, there's, there's uh, no guilt on him for not warning and not communicating the, the truth of this gospel message. You say, okay, that's great. Uh, what if I'm not called to be a teacher or a missionary or a pastor? What, what then? Well, the truth is the same, right? The truth is the same. We must be faithful by our life and our words to the gospel of the grace of God. What does that mean? The people around you, they need the gospel. They need the gospel. God puts you in their circle for a reason. Many of you have influences and connections that I do not have, right? And vice versa. And so because of the way that God has orchestrated uh, putting us into those situations, you then bear the responsibility in some sense of communicating that gospel truth. This past week, I uh, had the opportunity of going to a, a pastor's conference and um, taking little bits of uh, information that are helpful and trying to make sense of it is uh, it's an enjoyable thing for me. Uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about this week is the in the conference that one of the breakout sessions they were communicating reaching the one and how we we reach that that one that is lost and I was thinking through the 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 sphere of influence that we have and and how we can make sure that that one doesn't go unnoticed and that there is a communication there of the gospel I think it's important for all of us to recognize that um, God has blessed us with these contacts that we can we can use to reach people there be people in the workplace people in your family people that are across the street you name it right God has given us these different relationships so that we might go and communicate the truth of the gospel to them calling them into the kingdom of God and so here Paul says this is what I've done I am innocent of the blood of all men. He says, For I did not shrink from declaring to you, verse 27, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. He declared the whole purposes of God. This is how Paul can declare himself innocent. It's because he was faithful to declare the whole purposes of God. He did not shrink back. He did not literally to draw under. He did not... Um, did not pull himself away, but he stepped up and he shared. This, uh, this word, shrink back, it is used to describe the drawing down or the back of the sails of a ship. So they're tied down. He wasn't tied down. He was free, and he communicated the gospel. Don't tuck yourself away from declaring God's purposes. Don't tuck yourself away. There will be some who shrink away from teaching the, the whole purposes of God, right? And um, when we look at the leaders in the church, there's a, there's a definite example for them here in the way that Paul communicated. He, uh, he shared all of it, the whole purposes of God. We talked about last week how um, he communicated uh, the, the truth of God's word. And um, very clearly, this was center focus for him was communicating what God wanted him to communicate. Um, the whole purposes of God is what he shares. There's some, though, that don't do that. And so we have to uh, 
uh, recognize there's, there's a warning and uh, an encouragement not to be someone who skips around picking and choosing. Um, God's word is not a buffet, right? Uh, where you get to choose what you want and reject what you don't want. Uh, you have to eat your vegetables, right? And so uh, it's interesting in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, there, there's this charge that is given to Timothy. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, and do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Paul encourages Timothy in this way, focuses on communicating, always being ready to share the word of God, to preach the word. But there's that warning, right? As people in the congregation, the, the warning is, don't let your ears be tickled. Don't go after things that just make you feel good, right? You want, um, you want the word of God. The Word of God does have that ability to encourage and strengthen you, but it also has that ability to cut deep and lay open and bear the, the things in our lives that need to be changed and corrected. And so here we have this uh, exhortation, this encouragement. Paul declared the whole purposes of God, and I'll tell you right now, the reason I preach the way that I do is because I think that the best way, the best way I know how to preach the whole purposes of God is to work through a verse, uh, verse by verse, working through a passage of Scripture. And um, that way I make sure I don't miss something that might be important. And then I trust the Holy Spirit to um, enable you to make that application as, uh, as you humble yourself to the teaching of, of the Word. And so that's where we're at. That's why we keep going through the book of Acts week after week, and we see how, how the Holy Spirit works in a number of ways uh, through, through the apostles. And so Paul gives this declaration, this is the way I do it. I didn't shrink from declaring to you the whole purposes of God. And then verse 28, he, he shifts a little bit to his exhortation of the elders in their ministry. So he says, this is who I am, this is what I've done, and then let me tell you what you need to do. Paul's exhortation of the elders' ministry, he says, first of all, be on guard. And that gets echoed again later on to be on the alert. First of all, elders, leaders in the church are to be on guard for themselves, and then they are to be on guard for the flock. Verse 28 continues, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Be on, God, on guard for yourselves. The elder must first guard himself. How can he guard the church if he doesn't guard himself, right? And so he must first guard himself. That word to, to be on guard, it means to keep an, a watchful eye on, to hold his mind on. A shepherd must never think of himself as being, um, as arriving, right? to never examine himself, to never need to keep an eye on the things that he teaches and to examine the way that he conducts himself. Elder, first of all, must guard himself that he not be swayed by a wolf. Number two, he must guard himself that he doesn't become the wolf, right? And so he is to guard himself so that the flock then can be guarded. So first, elders guard themselves. Secondly, we guard the flock. Be on guard, it says, for all the flock. All the flock. Meaning that the elders must feed the flock, they must guide the flock, they must guard the flock. The flock is fed through being given the whole purposes of God. They're, they're guided by the shepherd's care and instruction and example. They're guarded by the shepherd's ever watchful eye. That is the job of an elder. 
a leader in the church. Guarding the flock is appointed to these overseers by the Holy Spirit. Notice that this is a Holy Spirit-appointed task. Understand this. Only the Holy Spirit can equip an elder for that work and endow him with the character and compassion and desire necessary to do that work. Only the Holy Spirit can make that happen. So I am grateful that it's done through the Spirit's enabling. I, uh, I remember um, early in ministry, thinking through what an elder's job was and how, how the, the gifting works and trying to um, think through how the church gets established. And I, I became a little bit um, discouraged, maybe even frustrated a bit in ministry in the early years as I um, engaged in a conversation about the Spirit's gifting of the pastor. And I was having a conversation, and the, the question was asked, should people serve in areas where they are gifted? And I said, yeah, they should serve in areas they're gifted. Next question, what if someone else comes along and they're more gifted than the pastor? Should the pastor then step down? And early on in ministry, I think it was maybe a desire to be humble, a desire to... Um, give give way I, I said maybe he should and at this point I'm I think that, that wasn't the greatest answer because of this the gifting of the Holy Spirit does not operate apart from the wisdom of the Holy Spirit and so we have to understand this that if God by the Holy Spirit calls you to serve in a particular ministry or to help in a certain way, then know that he will enable you to fulfill that mission. There's always going to be someone that is more gifted, right? So you might say, well, I'd like to serve in this area, but uh, they do it better. There's always going to be someone that's more gifted, but the Lord knows who fits best. And this is especially seen in the way that the Holy Spirit appoints elders, plugs them in, even when they might not be the, uh, the, the best, right? But God uses them. And so it's the Holy Spirit working to equip through the gifting, but it's also the Holy Spirit working to equip through his own wisdom. And so, we're called to serve by the Holy Spirit. And in many ways, it can look like this is something that is much involved with men, and, and it can seem that way, but the, the gifting and the establishing of those elders should be something that is done um, as the Holy Spirit leads. He continues, we are to be on guard for yourselves, for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to do what? To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. To shepherd the church of God. This is what an elder, uh, a pastor does. Notice this. The church does not belong to the shepherd. The church doesn't belong to the overseer. It belongs to God. So then, this relationship between the shepherd and God is equivalent to an under-shepherd and a chief shepherd. As he puts the pastor in that role to, to shepherd the flock, there is yet a, a chief shepherd that is above that shepherd. And so this is how God protects the, the church. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 Peter gives an exhortation to the leaders of the church, and uh, it's helpful for us in seeing that, um, that encouragement. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses one, verse 1 through 4. It says, Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ and as a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, 
but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge. Notice that they're allotted to our charge. God says, all right, I'm going to give you this little bit. You take care of them. It's cool. Mm -hmm. But proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So this is what shepherding the church looks like. This is what being an elder looks like. Shepherds of the church are to serve God. And they serve God by serving the church. What gives significance to this calling? What gives significance to the church? God purchased the church with his own blood. You have been blood bought. You have been purchased. There has been an exchange. His righteousness for our sin. My rags for his robe. Transitioned us from death to life. He has redeemed us, right? Ephesians 1 7 says in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us God purchased the church with the blood of his own son and if God bought the church with the blood of his own son how ought the shepherds to tend to the church well, we tend to it with our lives if Christ is willing to give up his life, how much should the elders follow in his example? In Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul has just mentioned this. He says, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Don't consider my life of any account as dear to myself. He says, my life belongs to God, and if he wants to use it this way, then I'm a slave to him. As he says, he is bound by the Holy Spirit. This is how a shepherd serves the church, recognizing that the church is special and precious. How precious? So precious that Jesus died for it. And then verse 29 continues, to be on the alert. They're called to be on the alert. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert. Remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Be on the alert. He says, wolves are going to come in. First, we see that they're going to come in from the outside. After Paul leaves, he knows that there's going to be wolves that come. His presence within the church, his spiritual authority, his apostleship, in some way would have deterred some of those wolves. And as he leaves, there would have been those who look at that as an opportunity to come in and sway some people, looking for power or position or possession. He says, watch out. These wolves will come in, and they are savage they are fierce, they are violent, they are cruel. They will not spare the flock. They don't show any leniency or refrain from their destruction. And so an elder must watch out for these wolves. Secondly, wolves come from within. This is probably a more, uh, more shocking scenario, more difficult to deal with scenario. See what wolves do. They it says here they speak perverse things. They they twist things. They draw away the disciples after them. What are these wolves after? What do they want? They want the flock's worship to their benefit, to the flock's harm. And so Peter says, Look, elders, you've got to keep an eye on these people. There are going to be those who come up within and those from without that just want to destroy the church. He says, you've got to be careful. 
Second Peter, Peter again echoing these uh, these concerns. In Second Peter chapter two, verse one, he says, "But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will." secretly introduced destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. There are those who want to destroy the church, swaying away people, as wolves led by by greed, by their own sensuality, their own desire for power, influence. So Elder Nathan, Elder Dotson, be on the alert. What does that mean for you? to be on the alert, remembering as Paul says, night and day I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Paul cries over these people. I know these wolves are going to come in and you need this admonishment, you need this instruction. Please listen to me. Elders cannot fall asleep at the will.
And uh, so as you see this response of, uh, or the encouragement from Paul to the elders, he says, I got one last opportunity. This is the last time I'm going to see you. This is what you need to know. Elders, this is your job. You guard the flock. You be on watch. You make sure that the wolves can't come in and, and destroy. Why? Because God loved it so much that he gave his son for it. So that should be both the, the motivation and the task for an elder. Should I pray together? Let's pray. Father, it is a blessing to be a part of this congregation. Father, we are so thankful that you have put us together, both by your Holy Spirit appointing the leaders within this church and by you establishing your church. We know that this is this is not a church that belongs to, to me or to anyone else, but it is yours. So Father, I pray that you would help us to treat it as such with care. I pray that you would give the, the elders of this church wisdom and discernment. Father, help us not to veer away from your word. Father, I pray that you would allow your word to be what um, dictates how we operate for both the the elders and the congregation. Father, we know that uh, ultimately you are over it all as uh, you have given us a, a chief shepherd in Jesus. Father, I pray that you would protect this church Protect it from wolves. From, protect it from people on the outside and people on the inside that may want to sway people, twisting the truth. Father, I pray that you would protect your people. Thank you so much for loving us to the extent that you would send your son into this world to die for us so that we might be a people that is called out for your purposes. Thank you that you allow each of us to serve one another by your Holy Spirit's enabling and your Holy Spirit's wisdom. Thank you for your grace in that. Help us as we seek to serve you through the rest of this week as we talk to each other, as we um, to make our way through the, the process of Establishing the gospel in our sphere of influence. I pray that you would give us boldness and courage. I pray that we would love people enough to share with them the joy of being a part of your kingdom. Help us to serve you as our king this week. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.